Hello, Fiendlings. How the hell are you? I saw a final voyage to the Demeter last night, and I have a few comments. First off, the film is beautifully shot, the ship incredibly creepy, and the soundtrack literally booming. As with most modern films, the soundtrack and effects nearly wipe out dialogue in multiple scenes, leaving you to infer what was said. Then again, I am half deaf, but even my fancy hearing aids couldn't make sense of what was going on. If you're at all familiar with the novel Dracula, you'll know the Demeter is the ship that crashes aground in England along with a certain being and its belongings. And what's a hungry vampire to do during a long voyage apart from snack on the crew? Dracula, along with Frankenstein, ushered in the idea that science and electric lights were no panacea against old superstitions and that evils committed in the name of progress are still evils. Dracula, however, shined in putting the new world against the old. The discordance between modern scientific thinking and that of ghosts, goblins, and fairy tales is far more prevalent in Bram Stoker's work than in Frankenstein. Demeter captures that, although it could have been done a little more subtly for my liking. The movie more or less ends as it began, a wrecked ship on the coast of England. But there is a twist I won't mention here. Overall, I enjoyed the flick. If you want the atmosphere of the storms, the ambient creak of timber under the stress of waves, and practically smell the awful, I recommend the theater. Otherwise, stream it with subtitles. Now that I have vented my critical spleen, it's time for more story. Be safe, have a great week, and we'll talk again real soon. Here's episode two of Closet Treats. Chapter seven. The room was still dark when Trey awoke. Carolyn lay on her back on the other side of the bed, snoring softly. Trey smiled at her. As usual, she kicked off the blanket and her breasts formed two small mounds below the sheet. Trey sighed. He swung his legs out from under the blue sheets and black comforter, attempting to keep from disturbing her. She needed to sleep. He smiled. Tiptoeing to the chest on the far wall, he slid open the bottom drawer, pulled out a pair of sweatpants, a sweatshirt, and a tee. His disc golf garb in hand, he stepped into the dark bathroom. He closed the door, once again thankful he'd oiled the hinges to keep them from squeaking. Trey's skin had already puckered with goose flesh from the morning's cold. Since they kept the thermostat at a cool 68 during the winter, stepping naked from the warm bed inevitably left him chilled. He slipped on the sweatpants, not bothering with underwear. The tea and the sweatshirt followed. He reached into the hamper and pulled out a pair of athletic socks, giving them a quick sniff. He recoiled at the stench and smiled. He sat on the window seat and pulled on the socks. With any luck, the smell would drive Dick crazy. Disgusting? Yes. But funny? Absolutely. He knew it was juvenile, but hell, so was Dick. Trey stepped out of the bathroom and made his way to the bedroom door. He gave Carolyn a last look. Her light snores were still audible above the sound of the heater. He smiled at her and opened the door, stepping through into the cool hallway. Helen's bedroom door stood open. Trey sighed again. The boy was already awake. Trey cocked his head, listening. Sure enough, he heard the sounds of the wee. He had to get that kid some exercise today. In another year or two, Trey hoped Alan would be throwing discs with him and Dick. Of course, that would require Dick to give up one of his nastier habits. He stepped down the wood panel stairs, lifting each foot and placing it down as gently as possible. A stair squeaked beneath his feet, sounding much too loud in the quiet hallway. He gritted his teeth as the electronic beeps and boops from downstairs ended with a chime. Trey smiled. He continued stepping until his feet hit the floor. He stopped. Alan, Trey called. If you try and spook me around the corner, I'm going to ground you for a week. Aw, oh, Dad, Alan said and giggled. He stepped forward into Trey's sight. You're no fun at all. That's right, Trey agreed. He walked to the boy and tousled his hair. Have you had your cereal? Alan nodded. Good. I'm going to be leaving soon. Do not, he said, waggling a finger. Wake up your mommy. Understood? Yes, Daddy, Alan said. You going to play discs with Dick? Trey nodded. Yeah, kiddo. Time to throw some plastic. Alan smirked. Is he going to win again? No, Trey growled. I'm going to take him today. Alan nodded, his smile wide. Uh-huh. I'll ask him about that. Trey chuckled. He placed a finger to his lips. Shh, kiddo. 
You're not supposed to call your daddy a loser. I didn't, Alan said. You're just not as good as Dick at discs. Right, Trey said with a sigh. Your old man stinks at disc golf. But he doesn't at Mario Kart. Yeah, right, Trey said. I need coffee, kiddo. Get back to your game. Yes, Daddy, Alan said. He padded back to the sunken living room and stood in front of the television. Trey watched as he unpaused the game and started swinging at digital baseballs. He shook his head and made his way to the kitchen. Chapter 8 After filling his travel mug with coffee, Trey wandered through the laundry room to the garage door. He took a deep breath. The closet man is waiting inside, a child's voice said in his mind. Trey shook his head. No, he whispered to it. There is no closet man. Trey opened the door. Cold air seeped out to chill his face. A pair of green eyes blinked at him from the darkness. Trey closed his eyes and stood still. Nothing happened. He reached his hand out and fumbled for the light switch. A barely audible click and he could see light through the closed eyelids. Exhaling, he opened his eyes. The garage was lit by two brilliant lights. He walked through the open door into the side wall. His disc golf bag hung from a hook. He grabbed it and then turned to face the rest of the garage. The lawnmower, weed whacker, and other garden implements stared back at him. His bicycle, waiting for spring weather, hung atop a pair of hooks from the ceiling. But no eyes. No closet man. Trey turned back to the door, flicking off the light switch as he stepped through. He closed it without looking back. The tightness in his chest released. He took another deep breath and then blew it out through his nose. Every trip to the garage was like that, seeing those green fluorescent eyes until light pushed away the darkness. He sipped at the coffee and headed toward the front door. His phone sat atop the bookcase in the hallway. There was a single text message. Ready, bitch? It was Dick, of course. They weren't supposed to even leave until 10 o'clock, but as usual, Dick was chomping at the bit. Trey sighed. He headed back into the living room, watching as Alan pounded another digital baseball toward the cartoon fences. Leaving, kiddo. Okay, Daddy, Alan said without turning around. Go bust him up. Trey chuckled. I'll do my best. No, Alan said, turning around with a smirk. Do better than that. Smart ass. Trey growled as he walked outside and into the cold. Dick's garage was already open. The big man stood next to his old car, munching on an apple. Dick was well over six feet tall and weighed about 290. The man was muscled, but a huge pop belly stuck out from beneath his shirt. He smiled as Trey walked down the driveway and across the street. About goddamn time, Dick said and took another bite from the apple. Bite me, Trey said with a grin. I'm 30 minutes early. Big whoop, Dick said through a mouthful of apple. You ready? Trey nodded. Holding the apple in his mouth, Dick pulled his keys from his pocket and opened the door. It swung open with a groan of protest. The Regretta. An old VW Jetta Dick had bought some years back. Still ran, but Trey was certain it was headed for the shop in another month or two. Ever since Dick had broken the 100,000 mark on the odometer, he'd christened it The Regretta. Trey opened the passenger side and placed the disc golf bag on the floor. He bent down and fell into the seat travel mug still in his hands. Dick groaned as he bent and managed to slide himself in. One of these days, Trey said with a grin, you're going to lose enough weight to actually fit in this thing. Fuck that, Dick snarled as he put the keys in the ignition and placed the apple in his lap. I'm just going to get a big-ass SUV and made for fat people. Trey laughed. That's called a Winnebago, Dick. Dick turned to him, his face set in a scowl. Fuck you, Leger, goddamn Cajun. Trey just smiled at him and took another sip of coffee. Dick shook his head. That's it. I'm kicking your ass so bad you won't even admit the score to your son. Are you kidding? He believes my lies. It's the nature of fatherhood. Dick harumphed and started the car. After several chuffing sounds and squeals from the starter, the engine fired. The radio sparked to life, Pink Floyd smashing through the speakers. Christ, turn that hippie shit down, Trey yelled above the den. With a grin... Dick turned the volume up, put on his seatbelt, and pulled out of the driveway. Chapter 9 The disc golf course was mostly empty. 
A few cars sat in the parking lot, but most of those were from the tennis players. Trey watched as Dick scanned the hills, looking for discs flying through the air. Nothing. He turned and smiled at Trey. Looks like we're loners today, Trey scowled. I guess you're going to imbibe then. Well, fuck yeah, Dick said, heading for the practice tee blanketed by pines and brush. Trey followed, his bag hanging from his shoulder. When they reached the edge, Dick pulled out a dirty white disc. He dropped his bag to the concrete and held the frisbee between his fingers. Watch and weep, Dick whispered and flung it. The disc flew between the branches, heading toward the metal basket. The disc hit the dirt just before the basket and spun around in a small circle before stopping. He turned to Trey. All right, whippersnapper, try and top that. Trey lowered his bag to the concrete and pulled out a blue disc. Move aside, old man, he said, and pushed Dick out of the way. Dick laughed, raised his hands, and moved to give Trey enough room. Trey stood parallel to the basket and flung the disc forehand. The disc took off with an awkward wobble, made a slight left turn, and then struck a tree limb. The disc bounced and landed in the brush. Fuck. Not a good start, youngin, Dick said in a flat tone. Maybe you should try again with a little less suck. Trey turned toward Dick. The man was smiling at him. Maybe you should drink a big cup of shut the fuck up. He smiled at Dick and then slapped him on the back. It'll get better. I fucking hope so, Dick laughed. I don't want to be here all day. The two men grabbed their bags and headed between the trees. Dick waited on the path while Trey crawled into the brush and stood where his disc landed. Mindful of the brambles, Trey picked up the blue frisbee, lined himself up, and flung the disc again. It stayed low, barely flying above the branches of an oak, slipped through a pine tree's nest, and landed next to the basket. Told you, Trey said as he walked back to the path. Dick harumphed and then walked to the basket. He didn't even bother dropping his disc in the chains. It was just practice after all. Dick turned toward the concrete walkway. Trey followed his gaze and frowned. Dick turned to him. Yep, it's time. He pulled a small glass pipe from his bag and a Bic lighter. Trey opened his mouth to say something, but Dick already had the pipe to his lips, flaring the flame into the small bowl and inhaling. The smell of marijuana crept through the winter morning. Dick exhaled a large green cloud, coughed, and then turned back to the walkway. Still no one there. He smiled at Trey and took another hit. Fucking hate it when you do this, Trey whispered. Dick shrugged, tapping out the coals while he held in the last of the smoke. He blew a cloud toward Trey, watching it whisk and break apart in the wind. Well, he said in a gravelly voice, tough shit. Once the pipe was back in his bag, he bent down, picked up his disc, and headed toward the first tee. Trey sighed and followed. One of these days, he said, you're going to get busted again. Dick rolled his eyes. Sheriff McCausland ain't going to throw me in jail, he said. I don't deal. I don't buy. I just, um, I have medical problems. Right. A medical problem that started in the 70s. The older man laughed. After the old bitch Dawson complained and he came by, I haven't had any more problems with her. He told her I have chronic arthritis. Old bitch bought it too. He winked at Trey. One of these days this shit will be legal. Till then, I'll just keep seeing McCausland at the cigar store. Uh-huh, Trey said. Why don't you throw a goddamn disc? Man, Dick said and looked up at the first basket in the distance. I need some Floyd. Trey laughed. Chapter 10 Trey led himself in the house. Ellen and Carolyn were gone. He smiled as he walked up the stairs into the bathroom. They would bring food. After walking around the 18-hole course for an hour and a half and searching through mud and brambles for his discs, he was damned hungry. He stripped off the now-dirty sweatpants and the damp sweatshirt. Dick hadn't even noticed the socks. Damn it, Trey thought. He'd forgotten to find an opportunity to stick them in his face. Oh well, he thought, maybe next time. Naked, he turned on the hot water and stepped into the shower. The water cascaded through his long hair, wiping away bits of bark and moss. Although it had been cold, they hadn't yet had a freeze, and everything in the forest was still alive. The oak trees were mostly naked, but the pines still had needles. The ferns still had fronds, and brambles were still everywhere. Shit, 
He counted himself lucky he had managed to skirt the patch of poison oak on hole five. He opened his eyes and watched water patter out onto the bathroom floor. He cursed and then pulled the shower curtain shut. The world immediately darkened and his stomach nodded. A wave of claustrophobia hit him and he had to close his eyes and take a deep breath before the feeling passed. Every damn time he got into the shower, it was like this. When he'd met Carolyn, he'd only been showering for a few years. Before that, it was the tub or nothing. Two baths, really. One to get the crap off him, drain the dirty water, and then a bubble bath to clean the skin. His hair had been shorter then, and he'd used the water from the tub to wash his hair. In his 20s, he finally decided to break the habit and take showers. But damn it, it was difficult. The claustrophobia was hard to break, and 12 years later, he was still fighting it. Trey longed for the day when he could stand in an elevator and not have his heart trip hammer in his ears. He picked up the bottle of shampoo and slowly lathered his long hair. Dick had kicked his ass at disc golf, as promised. Dick had said they should rename the game to Trey's 18 Holes of Suck. Trey chuckled as he remembered Dick's laughter. The guy was an asshole, a funny asshole, a good friend. Trey washed the shampoo out of his hair and quickly rubbed soap over his skin. Another final rinse of everything and he shut off the water. He reached for the shower curtain and stopped. He's out there, Trey, a voice whispered in his mind. He's out there and waiting for you. Trey shivered, but not from the cold air against his wet skin. He took another deep breath, closed his eyes, and pulled the shower curtain open. He stood there for a moment, naked in the cold, while the voice continued its chant. He opened his eyes. The bathroom was empty. No bad man standing there. No pair of green eyes staring back at him, or the shadow of a man standing tall against the wall. Just the clothes hamper, the sinks, the toilet. The voice went silent. He stepped out, water pattering against the tile floor. He grabbed a towel from the rack and wrung out his hair. The water streamed off onto the bath mat. It was damned cold now. Trey rubbed the water from his chest, back, and legs. Once finished, he put the towel back on the rack and walked toward the door. In his peripheral vision, he saw the yawning, gaping darkness of the closet. Something was grinning in there watching him. Trey ignored the fear that shook his spine and walked into the bedroom. The moment he crossed the threshold and he could no longer see the yawning closet, the fear abated. He took a deep breath. The closet man hadn't been this visible to him in quite some time. It had been at least a year since he'd seen him this much. Trey strode to the chest of drawers, pulled out a pair of briefs, slipped them on, and followed them with a pair of old jeans. After putting on a clean t-shirt, he headed downstairs. Carolyn and Alan still weren't back yet. Trey headed to the coffee machine and started another cup. The small cupboard caught his eye and he heaved a sigh. He opened it, pulled his large pill box out. He opened the first S compartment and dropped five pills into his palm. White, cream, green, yellow, blue. After retrieving a glass of water, he threw all five into his mouth and drained the glass. The pills were a miasma of different flavors and textures. The chalky taste of one hit the back of his palate on its way down, and he ignored the urge to retch. He bit on the damn things so long he wasn't sure he could remember a time when he hadn't taken them. He placed the box back in the cupboard. The coffee maker finished burping out the last of its dark liquid. Cup in hand, he sat at the breakfast table and stared out onto the back deck through the glass door. The water oak he planted three years ago had already grown a couple of feet and now reached for the sky, desperately trying to reach past the canopy of pines. The sun was already high in the sky, bathing the deck boards with light. If it wasn't so cold, he'd pull his laptop outside, set up shop on the deck, and maybe get some work done. But not today. Not today. Rattle of keys. Trey looked around toward the living room. The jingling sounded again. Trey stood from the table and walked past the living room and into the foyer. He smiled. Carolyn's tall form stood next to Alan's. Alan was trying out his new key again. Through the smoked and bent glass, he could barely make out Alan's frustrated expression. Won't turn, the boy said. Try again, Carolyn said with a sigh. Hurry up, kiddo. These bags are killing me. Trey fought the urge to go and unlock the door. 
He and Carolyn had talked about this, Alan needing to get used to letting himself in and out. That, of course, also meant he had to finally break in the damn key they'd given him. Another rattle echoed in the foyer, and then Trey heard the click. He smiled. Got it, Mommy, Alan said as he opened the door. He held it open for his mother. Trey walked past Alan and took the bags from Carolyn. See, Daddy, I can open the door all by myself. Yeah, Trey said with a laugh as he headed back into the kitchen with the groceries. I see that. Trey smelled quiche. His stomach growled with delight. He placed the bags on the island, turned, and Carolyn immediately kissed him on the mouth. Whoa, he whispered. What was that for? She smiled. I'll show you later, she said with a wink, and kissed him again. 